Hello students, welcome to another lecture video for CompSci 125 operating systems. In this video, we're going to talk about the address space. But before we proceed to the discussion of the address space, let us review the topics that we discussed previously. In the previous videos, we talked about CPU virtualization. The idea of CPU virtualization is that we have the CPU as a physical resource, and usually it is limited in number. With CPU virtualization, each process is allowed to think that it has unlimited access to the CPU. Uh, CPU virtualization does this by actually juggling processes to run on the CPU because the CPU, uh, most processes actually are either is a combination of CPU bound operations and IO bound operations. Whenever a process is doing or waiting for an IO to complete, the CPU is usually idle. So instead of the CPU doing nothing, the operating system will choose another process to run on the CPU. So in this way, the CPU is virtualized. Now in this chapter, we're going to look at another resource of a computer, which is the main memory. The main memory, as we've discussed, is volatile, meaning that the data stored in it is removed whenever or erased whenever power is removed and for the cpu to be able to execute instructions these instructions should be placed in the main memory so let's start with the topic of the virtualization of main memory The question to ask is what is memory virtualization? We have CPU virtualization, as I mentioned earlier. Now, how does memory virtualization work? The OS or the kernel virtualizes its physical memory. So remember that the program will be loaded to the main memory. And the OS provides an illusion uh, of a dedicated memory space per process. And it seems to be seen like each process uses the whole memory. So this is essentially what virtualization is. What are the benefits of virtualization? Of memory virtualization? One is uh, the ease of use in programming. With memory virtualization, the programmer doesn't need to know the exact location of the instructions and data in the physical memory. The, programming, the programmer can assume that he has or he can access all of uh, the main memory. It's also efficient in terms of time and space, and it guarantees the isolation for processes as well as the operating system or the kernel. This way, the process, an error process will not be able to mess up the memory of another process. Let's take a look at some historical perspective of how memory is used in earlier systems. So during the early days, the operating system is basically just a library. So it's a module. And as you can see in this illustration, we have Let's say we have this physical memory. The operating system 
is placed in a certain memory region, let's say the size is 64 kilobytes. So the operating system will be placed here and then it can only load one process in the main memory and that will execute until completion. Now this design leads to poor CPU utilization and memory efficiency. Because if you only have one program running on the excess memory in addition to the operating system, when the process is doing or when the current process is doing I.O., the CPU will actually be idle. So a better approach would be what if we can place more processes in the main memory? Because usually we have variable size processes, so or they have different memory requirements. So what if we place more processes in the main memory? So those are the characteristics of the early batch system. So these are usually batch systems. So if you have a task here, you load that into the main memory, you run it until completion, remove that, and then you have another task, run it until completion, then terminate. So that's the process. So this is basically uh, inefficient. Now with the growing needs of the users, they introduce the multiprogramming and time sharing approaches. Multiprogramming, basically what it does is to allow multiple processes in memory. As you can see in this diagram, the main memory is divided into chunks and in multiprogramming uh, you put several several processes in the main memory as you can see here there are three processes processes a b and c then what happens is you execute one process for a short while switch between processes in memory and this actually increases CPU to CPU utilization. Because remember in the von Neumann architecture, the instruction and the data should be in the main memory before the CPU can execute them. Now over time, the systems became more interactive, meaning there is an active interaction of the user and the uh, operating system or the process that are running. So this is uh, the introduction of time sharing. So the operating system can switch from one process to another rapidly, providing an illusion of interactivity. And with multiprogramming, okay, it also introduced a uh, protection issue. What if a user process accesses another user process for the kernel? Let's say in this illustration, let's say process A without any protection might try to attempt to read the memory of process B, or it can even attempt to write or read the contents of the operating system. Uh, MS-DOS, which, which is an early operating system from Microsoft, actually has this problem because it allows user processes to access the memory area of the kernel command.com, command interpreter, for example. Now, in order to support these growing requirements of multiprogramming and time sharing, we need to do some abstraction. 
The idea is to define what we call an address space of a process. So the OS creates an instruction of physical memory. This is called the address space or the address mapping, which contains information all about a running process. So as you can see, this is an address space. And the size is 16 kilobytes. A running program, or essentially a process, has its own view of the memory where it is uh, located. So that's called the address space. So every process has its own address space. So it's, you, you abstract that and you get this diagram here. And an important thing to remember is that this, uh, this address space may not be actual locations in physical memory. So as with the definition of abstraction, the address space is just a simplification of uh, the memory area that can be accessed by a process. But it does not necessarily map to the actual physical address, as we will see later. And when it comes to the address space of a process, it typically consists of program code, the heap, the stack, and other important memory, me memory regions like uh, a mapping of shared memory for shared libraries. But for a typical simple process, static, statically linked process, it will have a program code, the heap, and the stack. And this is how it will look like. So the size here is 16 kilobytes. Let's have a short description of the different parts of a process's address space. The first is the code, which is the actual instructions, the location and memory where the instructions are placed, the heap, which is a memory area used in dynamic memory allocation, specifically the memory area used by malloc or uh, new in object-oriented programming languages. Then we have the stack, which store, stores the return address during function calls or return values. And it can also contain local variables, actual parameters to function. The main difference between the stack and the heap is that the stack grows downwards in the memory, whereas the heap grows upward. This means that when you allocate more memory from the heap, uh, the allocation will, the addresses being used will be increasing, whereas for the stack, the addresses will be decreasing from a high value address to a lower value address. Now let's talk about the virtual address. So again, I'd like to emphasize that the memory that a process sees that it owns is called its address space. And that address space, of course, will have virtual addresses. So you can think of this as the abstraction is the virtual memory and the actual memory is the physical memory. Processes will see this virtual memory. The OS is the one that maps the virtual memory to the physical memory. And the virtual memory has a virtual 
address as whereas the physical memory has physical addresses. So every address in a running program is actually virtual. And it's the OS that translates the virtual address to physical address. This is an example program. So let's take a look at the code here. You can download the code from the OS site. So let's take a look at the source code. So as you can see here, we have the main function, and then it simply prints the address of main, which is the location of the code. And this one it tries to allocate a certain amount of memory and places it in the heap, it will return the address. Then we have a local variable here, and then uh, it will print the location of the spot. Now let's take a look at the make file. So I added the, the minus G here to generate uh, debugging information. So let's, we can debug this process. Uh, in GDB. The expected behavior when we run this program is it should have uh, a fixed value for the memory here. It's this changing, but unfortunately, as you can see, the the code is actually, uh, the location is actually changing. As you can see in the addresses. So this is because the operating system, Linux, prevents uh, or actually randomizes the placement of memory so that it will not be predictable. And for this is basically used for security purposes but to counter that first uh, this is called the address space uh, layout randomization mitigation so we can disable this uh, for this session actually we disable the aslr when we run the code it will always have the same values, the same location, 58194010. So we disable the address space layout on the section. So these are these addresses here are actually virtual addresses. Okay, so take note of that. All the addresses that a running process is seeing or displaying or is processing are called virtual addresses. It belongs to the it belongs to the address space of the process. Now it's better if we can uh, take a look at this in GDB. Okay. So I'm sure you've used GDB before. So let's try to run this code in GDB. So we set the breakpoint and then we run this code and it will stop in the 
breakpoint. Then there is a command in JDB to view the address space of the process or the address mapping. If you can see here, uh, these are actually the parts of the code. And then, so this is the memory areas for the code. So it has three pages or four KB pages for, for each size. Not, not this later, but we have uh, these pages. And then we have, so we can think of this uh, somewhere here is the code and the data. And then this area here pertains to a shared memory area because the, the code is using shared libraries. As you can see here, you have the libc, which is the standard C library. And then you also have an area here for the linker or the loader. So it's also used. And then we have the stack here. So as you can see there's no heap yet. Now, if we trace to the execution, so it outputs uh, for the main function, it outputs, it outputs 5189. So if you look somewhere here, we'll have uh, 5189. So the code that we are executing is sub probably somewhere here. Okay. Then if we continue the execution, so here we have uh, the allocation in the heap, and this is the location of the heap, location in the heap. So if we, if we go back, if you look at the memory mapping, you can see that we now have the heap here because we already allocated uh, memory. And then lastly, we have this one, which contains the address of the variable x on the stack. Okay, so that's how it works. So this is the code uh, mentioned earlier, and this is the output on a 64-bit Linux machine. This is quite old, but you've seen already uh, the output when we viewed the process within GDB. So it's better to look at it that way. So what is what are the goals for a virtual memory system? The first one is called transparency and uh, the idea is to make sure that the implementation should be invisible in the process that means that the process can only uh, doesn't have to do anything program doesn't have to do anything uh, it can act it, it can access any memory it thinks uh, it can okay and it, it seems like a process owns the entire physical memory, even though that is not the case. Second goal is efficiency, which uh, in terms of time, when you implement a virtual memory system, it should not make the processes run slowly and it should not incur too much memory use. Okay. So we will need, this will actually would require further support like TLBs and other capsules. And lastly, for protection and isolation, meaning uh, a process should not be able to uh, access the memory of other processes. There should be a violation. So usually, 
when you have a segmentation fault, for example, it is the operating system responding that it kills your process because it's trying to access memory area that it is not supposed to access. So we'll stop here for this chapter.